Hi, everybody, and welcome to Conversations in Interventional Cardiology. My name is Suzanne Barron. I'm the Deputy Editor for J. Sky and the Director of Interventional Cardiology Research at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. I'm honored to be representing uh, J. Sky here and the Editor-in-Chief, Dr. Alexander Lansky. You can find us online at jsky.org and follow us on X, formerly known as Twitter, at, at MyJSky. JSky is the home of all official Sky documents, and we're here today to discuss a really important document that was just published in JSky titled uh, Atrial Shunt Therapy for Heart Failure, uh, an update. I am joined by an esteemed panel of Sky leaders and experts. Uh, first, we have Dr. Vic uh, Dagadeeson. He is a JSky editorial fellow, as well as an assistant professor of medicine uh, at West Virginia University Heart and Vascular Institute in Morgantown, West Virginia. We also have Dr. Bill Gray, who's the System Chief of Division of Cardiovascular Diseases at Mainline Health, as well as the President of Lincoln Out Heart Institute in Winnowood, Pennsylvania. And finally, Dr. Sanjeev Shah, uh, who is uh, the Stone and, uh, Endowed Professor of Medicine, as well as the Director of Research at the Bloom Cardiovascular Institute um, in, uh, in Chicago, Illinois. Thank you all for being here. Um, I think I'll start off by turning it to uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Jagadeeson to start the discussion, uh, including why is this an important document, what is the topic, and what do we need to know about this? Great. Thank you, Dr. Barron. Um, this was a great um, collaborative effort that um, all of us put forth together on uh, really coming up with a contemporary com comprehensive review of an exploding space that's um, really uh, gotten traction over the last probably five to 10 years with a lot of uh, trials underway <clears throat> with various devices. Um, and so to begin, atrial shunt therapy, in general, we know um, Guideline-directed medical therapy for HEFREF has uh, been well-established and had a lot of advancements over the last 10 to 15 years. Uh, and across the spectrum of ejection fraction, we've seen probably the most advancement from device-based therapies as well as uh, medical therapy, pharmacologic-based therapies in HEFREF or reduced ejection fraction. We've seen limited advancements in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, albeit though most recently, at least uh, contemporarily, at least we've gotten some promising data uh, in the pharmacologic space, specifically in the SGLT2 inhibitor, as well as um, uh, potentially in, in limited cases, um, ARNI or um, Secubitril Valsartan therapy. But the what we do know in the space across the spectrum of heart failure, and specifically with preserved ejection fraction, is that uh, functional status remains limited and uh, symptom burden can be uh, quite cumbersome and impair the quality of life overall in this difficult to treat patient population. And so um, the motivation to help define novel ways or help discover novel therapies for this patient population to alleviate symptom burden as well as improve functional status has come to light. And most recently, and the topic for this discussion is uh, atrial shunt therapy. So before we uh, get into kind of the specific um, devices, uh, overall, and this is just a, a limited schematic of how um, one can characterize and um, stratify uh, phenotypically uh, heart failure with this, this, and this diagram is specifically with heart failure preserved ejection fraction, um, which there's the most randomized clinical trial data out in this space for. So in this particular case, uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction appears to be the best targeted phenotype, although a lot of trials are looking at specifically this atrial shunt therapy across the spectrum of EF. But for the purposes of discussion to start off, um, we uh, are starting to see progressive data and um, effectual potential uh, beneficial effects specifically in this population. And uh, all phenotypes are not the same. Heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is quite um, a, uh, a, a disease that has very different phenotypic presentations. And this is just one schematic on how to help categorize and help identify patients who may benefit from atrial shunt therapy, because uh, all of our data up until this point has determined that atrial shunt therapy is not for all. And so 
This is one schematic, and this is mainly a hemodynamic um, uh, based uh, way to categorize HEFPEF. -hef. Um, there's also a, a more complex, which was dedicated to a, a probably a whole nother conversation on the pathobiological uh, phenotypic differentiation that um, is a whole nother topic altogether. But the first stratification is based on resting um, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. And afterwards, uh, usually stressing the system, especially if you have a resting pulmonary capillary wedge of less than 15, stressing the system with exercise, um, usually um, done particularly in trials with supine bike and exercising at least to a 20 watt um, uh, capacity. Type one, we uh, consider when the wedge increases above 25 or you have a wedge to cardiac output ratio of greater than two. And this is termed exercise induced left atrial hypertension. Uh, type 1. And if you have a wedge pressure greater than 15 and you meet any one of these criteria listed here, uh, if you have one of them present, yes, this is called a type 3 or heart failure, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction um, defined by latent pulmonary vascular disease, which will come up later in our discussion. If you don't have any one of these criteria, you're deemed to have type 2 HEFPEF, which is a resting left atrial hypertension. And we'll get more to this in our discussion afterwards. So our paper goes through um, the different uh, uh, devices that are available, uh, particularly in clinical trial, at different stages in clinical trial development and investigation. Probably the most well-studied and the most uh, randomized clinical trial data today is with the Corvia device. Uh, on the farthest left here, which is a fixed shunt size of eight millimeters in size. And you can see there are various devices from various different companies across. Um, that includes V-Wave, the Occluder, as well as the Edwards, um, which is kind of the most novel, looking at a left atrial to car um, coronary sinus shunt, um, and this is about seven millimeters. The first four that you see here are implant-based, where the actual shunt uh, is left with a permanent implant um, within the heart. The next three, which are at various um, investigational stages as well, are implant or device-free uh, strategies that uh, mainly focus on creating um, or coring a uh, the, the septum to create uh, uh, a, a septal defect, but not leave an implant to maintain patency kind of throughout um, after, after the procedure is completed. So this is a uh, one of one of the tables from uh, the paper that is designed to sort of summarize all of the trials. It's a busy slide. Apologize for that. But maybe to highlight sort of the point is, is not to get hopefully sort of bogged down in all of the minute details, but maybe focus on sort of large scale picture, how these trials differ from each other and how they become important in how we interpret these trials and the data that may ultimately come from those that are in process. As I mentioned before, the most well studied so far is the Corbia system, uh, which has the most randomized sham controlled trial to date, and uh, all based on include uh, exercise right heart catheterization, which uh, it is uh, important to consider because a lot of the other trials that you may see um, in process or already completed not do not always employ exercise right heart catheterization in the inclusion or um, uh, patient selection. So something to keep in mind as we talk about how patients are selected for these trials, as well as ultimately for atrial shunt therapy. Uh, in addition to that, we have probably the most uh, out of the randomized clinical trial data evidence to this point, the closest that we have in another device category, which would be with V-Wave, is uh, just completed enrollment. We don't have the, um, uh, the published data uh, yet, but the closest coming up from a pivotal trial is a Relieve HF looking at the V-Wave device awaiting um, dissemination. The rest are a lot of open label studies. Um, we have a lot of pivotal randomized sham control trials underway, particularly with Alclitec, the atrial flow regulator. Um, we have Alleviant Medical um, uh, also underway, the Edwards left atrial to coronary sinus, the Apsure shunt device also underway, and a bunch of open label smaller studies that are in process. Uh, 
The summary on the right here is all the outcomes, but suffice it to say, without getting bogged down too much, is that looking at mainly markers of quality of life, hemodynamic outcomes, um, as well as uh, essentially those, primarily those um, quantified by KCCQ, NYHA, six-minute walk tests, and looking at various hemodynamic parameters such as changes in pulmonary capillary wedge, right atrial pressures, and pulmonary arterial pressures. This is the, uh, from the randomized trial data that we have, this is from the Corvia device, which again, I alluded to earlier, is the most well-studied device in terms of randomized clinical trial data. And the, the entire field has been focusing on finding the right patient, like I mentioned, alluded to before, that benefit from atrial shunt therapy. And what we know is uh, from the best and largest amount of randomized clinical trial data evidence that we have, the reduced LAP um, studies were neutral, heart failure too neutral overall. But when a post hoc analysis was done on the on this patient population, we found an identi we uh, identified a potential responder group. And when you look at the hierarchical composite outcome, looking at net wins um, and plotting them against peak exercise PBR. We noticed that patients who got the atrial shunt device between, using a cutoff of an exercise PBR less than 1.74 wood units uh, ended up clinically benefiting from the device than those who had uh, an exercise PBR of greater than 1.74, suggesting that Going back to the first slide about the potential type 3 HEFPEF, those with um, latent pulmonary vascular disease may uh, not benefit compared to those that didn't. In addition, that's not um, shown in this slide, is that in addition to having an exercise peak PVR cutoff, the patients also uh, could not or did not have a cardiac rhythm management device, such as a pacemaker or ICD. The most important, uh, you know, as this as this field sort of blossoms in terms of data, lots of clinical trials and lots of companies in the field, the most important thing to also consider one of the figures from the paper is the effect of the placebo effect, which tends to be pretty strong, particularly um, in these device-based trials. And so a lot of uh, pub a lot of published data is open label. Uh, and uh, what we see here on the left is if you have a lower starting baseline KCCQ, such as in the reduced LAP that you can see here on the left, as well as Relieve and AFR Prolieve, which is the Oclitec device up here in the V-Wave, you can see that the lower baseline KCCQ patients in open label studies tend to have a very strong delta KCCQ just based on the, in the placebo sham group. And you can compare this to uh, some of the pharmacologic trials in HEFREF as well as HEFPEF uh, that um, actually have a higher baseline KCCQ but less of a placebo effect. All to say that um, open label trials are important and you know they're in, uh, uh, progressively adding to the body of literature, but ultimately due to the strong placebo effect that we've seen in these trials that uh, ultimately the goal, the ideal goal, and as we start to investigate more and more devices is to, is to optimally design the trial in a double-blinded placebo-controlled fashion. So in conclusion, and then to open up discussion, we've seen that uh, HEFPEF seems to lag behind in terms of uh, pharmacological advancements compared to HEFREF and HEFREP. Uh, and particularly, uh, the focus in this particular population has been on optimizing quality of life, alleviating symptom burden, and improving overall functional status. This is where atrial shunt therapeutics, particularly in HEFPEF, but again, we can discuss uh, across the spectrum of EF, of uh, what role it may play in addressing therapeutic gaps in heart failure. There's a lot of numerous open-label single-arm studies for various devices that I alluded to before that have demonstrated optimistic safety and feasibility um, uh, and effectiveness from a clinical endpoint standpoint. Uh, we have the largest body of randomized clinical data that suggested a specific responder group from the Corvia device, which is now being studied in a dedicated fashion, dedic dedicated fashion in this dedicated responder group. Uh, 
We have ongoing pivotal randomized control trials for other devices that are underway. And ultimately, patient selection is key as to identifying which heart failure phenotype will benefit most from dynamic decompression of the left atrium. Uh, so that's a quick summary of the, of, uh, of the paper, and um, we can open it up to discussion. Well, that was a, a great summary of not only a uh, very broad uh, topic, but a really exciting talk to, topic when we think about um, treating our patient, this patient population. I, uh, I actually just came off uh, inpatient service in the hospital, and so many of the patients that were admitted were patients with uh, decompensated heart failure. Um, and you start to wonder uh, how these types of devices may improve quality of life and reduce uh, hospitalizations for these patients. So I, I'd like to, uh, if it's all right, kind of touch on some of the uh, points that you brought up and then, you know, ex uh, bring in our, our panel uh, to ask them some questions as well. You, you ended this by saying patient selection is gonna be incredibly important. Um, and so I think there's a few things to kind of parse out there. You know, when we start to think about this, you know, there's multiple phenotypes of, of, of HEFPEF, as you pointed out, and then there's also HEFREF. Um, as we think about this spectrum, this huge spectrum of patients, um, and I'll, I'll put this out to the panel, not to put you on the spot, uh, doc, uh, Dr. Jagadeesh, because you just did such a lovely job uh, explaining everything, but to the panel, Dr. Gray, Dr. Shaw, um, in your experiences, or, or if you were looking into a crystal ball, are there specific phenotypes um, of uh, heart failure patients that you think are going to specifically benefit um, from these, uh, these types of devices? I'll start. Um, I think it's a great question. And, you know, it's something that I think we need to be open to. Just the fact that there may be this type of therapy that's not a one-size-fits-all approach. And I often will bring up CRT and HEFREF as an example. Uh, there we had trials. We didn't really know. We thought heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. We need to resynchronize these patients. And uh, there was a lot of heterogeneity in the early trials in 2004 and, and the mid-2000s. And it took a good you know, five to 10 years to figure out that it's really patients with an EF that's below 30 to 35 percent, left bundle branch block, a wide, very wide QRS that benefit the most. And so this isn't something that is totally new in the heart failure field, this sort of precision medicine approach. And I think here where we are instituting, inserting a device that is causing left to right shunting, I think it's fairly obvious that we can't have patients with right-sided heart failure, significant RV dysfunction, significant tricuspid regurgitation. So we really need to take that into consideration first and foremost. Those patients definitely are not going to benefit from overloading an already sick right side of the heart. And the other thing is ejection fraction. You know, I think the reason why in the Corvia trials, when we started this journey, I've been working on it for 15 years. And the, the question of HEFREF, even back then, was that it's such a crowded space that there's already a lot of GDMT, a lot of de devices for it. So the bar will be very high to benefit that patient. But the other thing is that patients with HEFREF, you know, if you look at studies, uh, although there's you know quite a, pa a few patients with HEFPEF who have RV dysfunction, it's more common in HEFREF to have RV dysfunction and right-sided failure. And in fact, if especially in patients in whom GDMT has failed. So GDMT has failed, they're still sick, they're still having events, they're still symptomatic. Those are the patients with RV failure and they're not gonna benefit from the shunt device. Now, I'm very curious to see the V-Wave results, this Relieve HF trial that's gonna come out, we think um, at ACC, so just a couple months. They, they enroll patients across the EF spectrum and they were quite sick. But, uh, you know, so I'm, I'm hoping that we're surprised by those data, but I can tell you from the trial that we did, the reduced LAPHF2 trial, first of all, patients with heart failure and mildly reduced EF did worse than half puff. And if we look at the subgroup analyses by global longitudinal strain, which we know is a more sensitive measure of LV systolic dysfunction, by tertiles of global longitudinal strain, the worst tertile did the worst with the device, mid tertile kind of uh, in the middle, and the best tertile, so the best LV systolic function did the best with the device overall. So at least based on this one trial, it's just one trial, and it's one device, it does seem that the more preserved the EF, uh, you know, EF greater than 50 is going to benefit the most, as far as we know. And, you know, the last thing I'll say is that we did, you know, we were, I was very, 
course, as as you know, as someone who a lot of blood, sweat, and tears went into that trial uh, of the the reduced LAPHF one and two trial, I was disappointed to see the totally neutral result of a win ratio of one point zero. In fact. One of um, the other uh, investigators in the field on the on one of the other trials said you can't get more neutral than a win ratio of 1.0. But what that means is either there's absolutely no effect overall, it's just inert, or there's a responder and a non-responder group. And you know, we still have to prove that it's that what we found is real, but we really found quite a quite a responder group and a non-responder group. In fact, earlier this year at the European Heart Failure Meeting, uh, we presented data that showed that at two years heart failure events were reduced by 50% in the responder group and were up twofold, so 200% increase in heart failure events in the non-responder group who got the device. So the data that we have thus far pretty, you know, pretty strong in this one trial saying that you know, really need to have a low exercise PVR and you can't have a pacemaker ICD. As, and we think that's because it's a sign that it's a sicker LV, sicker RV. Uh, now, again, that needs to be borne out in trials. I think really what you're speaking to is the incredible heterogeneity of this patient population. And I think in some ways that's also reflected a little bit in the heterogeneity of some of the devices that are also under investigation. You know, I was really struck looking at the slide of all of the different devices, the fact that there's multiple different sizes. Most are, you know, left atrial, right atrial connections, but there's also the left atrial to coronary sinus connection. Um, so I, uh, maybe I'll throw this to you, Dr. Gray. Uh, in your experience, or, or again, looking into the future, uh, do you think that there is going to be one optimal device that would treat these responding pa these patients who are in the responder groups, or do you think that there's going to be uh, certain patients that will benefit from one device more than another? Um, it's a great question. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'll just add on to what Sanjeev talked about earlier. And, and respecting all the work that went into really the only completed randomized controlled trial with data reported. Um, other, other, you know, analyses of other single arm, not placebo controlled, so there's some placebo, uh, there's some, uh, there's some, uh, sorry, not sham controlled, and so there may be some placebo effect there, have not shown a detriment uh, to patients who had um, increased in PVR, although not exercise related. Um, so it's, it's, it's confusing. It's a mixed bag still, and uh, it's. I think I think the analogy of CRT is a good one, where the building blocks will will be added up uh, over the course of multiple trials. But to get to your question, um, I I think you know it's it's so early yet. We don't really know the optimal shunt size, and that may vary depending on the type of heart failure, the type of the type of the phenotype of the of the um, of the uh, HEF-PEF uh, specifically. Um, we don't know any of that yet, um, so we're kind of gr grasping a little bit. We have to get a foundational, you know, um, effect uh, on these patients before we can start stratifying effects. Um, and the second, and the second thing is that um, you know, all of the devices except the Edwards trial. And I'm a little biased because I was the principal investigator for the EFS Edwards trial. All of the devices are interatrial shunt trials. And there are some early data suggesting that um, when you interrupt the interatrial septum, you change the flow dynamics of blood flow entering the IVC and SVC, from the SVC and IVC into the RA, where there's a vortex swirl that actually feeds into the RV. Um, when you change that, that may actually that may have an effect on RV function, uh, may, sub, may become suboptimal. And when we uh, shunt through the uh, coronary sinus, that flow dynamic, that flow vortice is maintained. So there may be some differences. Again, that, that's all speculative, all theoretic, until we see clinical evidence that actually supports that. So I, don't want, I wouldn't go very far with that, but it, as, to answer your specific question, it's to, it's still to be determined. It's very, 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 very early. Yeah, we, we did do, um, I totally agree. And I, I think that's the really interesting thing about the Edwards device, that the flow, you know, through the coronary sinus, it kind of just follows the RV outflow. So you're really not interrupting flow in the atrium, which you are doing with these other devices. And and whether, if if we're, if we do that kind of flow, maybe patients with a sick or RV or latent pulmonary vascular disease could benefit. The only thing we know about shunt size is that um, based on, the Corvia trial again, you know, women tended to do better than men 
And in terms of the, you know, women are shorter and uh, they have, you know, smaller hearts. We know that. And, you know, so if you think about it, the shunt size is a bit bigger in women. Uh, the shunt size divided by heart size, let's say, is, is bigger in women than than men. And they, they despite that fact, they did they seem to do better. Um, and also when this is not published data, but when we look at the um, size of the shunt, you know, if we look across height, or if we look across body surface area or anything, there's no difference at all. Um, you know, and so I'm not sure, although, you know, just from a physiological standpoint, it does seem that size should matter because hearts are so different in size and atria are so different in size. So we'll really have to see, and, and I'm excited about some of these um, devices that have multiple different sizes. In fact, one that we didn't show uh, in that table in the paper was the Adana medical device, which is a adjustable size. Uh, so you can go in there and adjust it up and down, which I think is really interesting. So like like Bill said, there's there's just a lot that we still need to learn in the, in the field. I think, that, you know, again, this is such a an open field and something that's just growing so much. It's so exciting as we think about all these trials that are coming out um, and we think about um, what we're looking for uh, as outcomes for these patients. You know, I was also really struck by the fact that there's there's definitely clearly going to be a, a focus on patient-centered outcomes, changes in KCCQ, changes in a uh, six-minute walk test. And, and uh, Dr. Jagadeesan, you, you, you pointed out, you know, the, the placebo effect. So I guess I wanted to, to kind of throw out to the panel um, how important, as we continue to study these devices, how important do we feel that sham control trials are? At what point will we feel that we are comfortable moving beyond a sham control trial to looking at comparing dif these different phenotypes or comparing head to head these different um, uh, different uh, devices themselves? So I kind of would be curious as to what the the panel might think about that. Yeah, I, I, I'll just take a quick stab at it, but the others are much more um, expert than I. I, I think we're let, let me just say this. I think I look at this field as job security because there's so much to learn in this field. Um, and there, we're, a, we're a long way off from not having sham control requirements. Um, on just about every single arm study without a sham or without a control arm has shown some benefit. And when and when then when Corvia and Corvia was one of the ones that did that. Uh, but when they went through the randomized control trial, uh, they weren't able to show that same benefit across the spectrum of the patients they enrolled. And so I think it's critically important, um, especially if you're going to lean on patient-centered outcomes, which I think is very important in this, in this disease state, um, that, that we have a sham control for the foreseeable future. I don't see that going away anytime soon. Um, I don't know what the others think, but that's my, my take on it. Yeah, I mean, just from... Uh being an enrollee in, in this this follow-up trial which is dedicated to this responder group responder hf just from even anecdotal evidence of just having patients go through um, the process with um, getting randomized and getting assigned to one intervention another it's quite as the as the only unblinded investigator at the it's it's quite impressive to see just firsthand how powerful the placebo effect is um just with within as short a time as 30 days um as the unblinded sort of uh investigator it's just so interesting to see it you don't you can read about it in in an article or uh you know look at this graph but it doesn't quite hit you until you actually are managing patients in front of you who experience quite a significant um, placebo effect. It, it's been it's been unreal to see just it unfold uh, in front of you in the clinic. Yeah, we we had a patient the first reduce LAPHF one one of my long term hep hep patients just real sick and symptomatic, and he underwent the procedure. And I was I was the blinded heart failure investigator, and shortly after the procedure, he diuresed twenty pounds. He felt amazing. And he he was convinced that he got the device, you know, and I, I couldn't really explain anything about what happened to him, but he felt so much better, could walk farther, diarrhea. And when the time came a year later, uh, when we unblinded, it turned out that he had gotten the sham procedure. So, you know, the, the brain is a very powerful thing. And, and my advice to, um, to industry sponsors of these devices is really, really, you've got to do the sham control trial 
early on, and I would do a fairly large sham control trial after my experience here with about, you know, anywhere from 100 to 150 patients. You know, obviously the capital needs to be raised to do that type of study, and Ed Edwards is doing that with their device in the AltFlow 2 trial, which I was really happy to see because it's very unlikely that every patient's going to respond. And this way, you know, there's, there's this sort of uh, middle, you know, middle of the road sort of investment where you can get really good data, you can get really detailed invasive hemodynamic data, um, and you can get other outcomes like uh, patient-centered outcomes and heart failure events and things, and really begin to see who is benefiting from the device. So I'm hoping that there's more of that going forward. I think we also have to have some realistic expectations about what the effect size is going to be here. If we have patients on guideline-directed medical therapy, and we would imagine to add another pharmacologic agent that might be effective, you know, the marginal difference may be, you know, relatively small. Um, I, I liken this to renal denervation, where we have patients who have resistant or multiple, multiple, multiply treated um, medications for hypertension, and expecting uh, an interventional therapy to cure them is is not reasonable. And I think we have to be very careful that we put these things in perspective, that we do want to see improvements. We do want to see outcomes that which are demonstrated to, to justify an implant. Uh, but we also have to recognize these patients are already at maximum therapy and, and, and should be uh, before they enroll in a trial. I think that's a wonderful way to kind of wrap everything up in, in bringing together um, the importance of picking the right patients, of setting the right expectation for the patient as well as the providers, and really calling on the scientific community, you know, both clinicians, researchers, industry, government sponsors, everybody to really put the work in early to do the right trials so we can identify who the right patients are going to be who are going to benefit from this, from, from these, you know, very new novel um, approach to treating a, a very widespread disease. So I want to thank all of uh, my, uh, all of the panelists uh, for uh, joining today. I'd like to thank Dr. Javadeeson for presenting and certainly would like to thank uh, Sky, uh, Jay Sky for sponsoring this uh, conversations in interventional cardiology. Thank you very much.